Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. On this wonderful day where we are honouring Rory Kethlin Jones and him being awarded his honorary fellowship of the museum. A wonderful day and we really appreciate you joining us here. Uh, my name is Andy Clark. I'm a trustee here of the museum. I was one of the founding trustees and spent some while being chair of trustees. Uh, a mantle I've passed to Andrew who's doing a, a sterling job. So, the format now is that Rory and I will just chat and uh, we'll see what comes out. <laughs> Rory, would you mind picking up the, uh, the award? Thank you. So, a little bird tells me that when the museum approached you to say that they would like to award you this honorary fellowship, it, it was a bit of a surprise to you. Is that the case? Well, yes. Um, I'm going to put it down because it's quite heavy, it's quite actually. Heavy. Uh, yeah. Um, and why? Well, because I suffer from something called imposter syndrome, which I think lots of people suffer from. Uh, and my relationship with computers uh, started really late. So uh, I went down the sort of arts route at school, uh, and there was one computer at my school, which was Dulwich College, uh, and it filled an entire room in the science block, and you were only allowed to approach it if you were doing physics A-level and wearing a white coat. <laughs> and I had neither the white coat nor the, the, the physics A-level qualification. So there was an open day at school, and I went and peered at it and was <laughs> slack-jawed in wonder. Uh, this is in the early 70s. but. Uh, had no interaction with computers. My first, well, one of my first, th this is quite an embarrassing story. Uh, I started in the BBC in Leeds, which was uh, a very analog place in those days, the BBC newsroom in Leeds in 1981. They were still shooting on film rather than videotape. Computers, what are those? Uh, the, the clatter of typewriters, uh, the fog of cigarette smoke, uh, the sound of cursing from the news editor, uh, and the smell of beer from the bar below, where the news editor would go uh, every evening at half past five for a couple of pints before we put the programme on air. Uh, and then I arrived in the London newsroom, and it was not much more modern, the London television newsroom and television centre. Bakelite phones, there were electric typewriters uh, with a fleet of ladies of a certain age who used to type your scripts for you, just to stand there uh, dictating your scripts. And then they did something incredibly radical. In 1984 or 1985, they decided to bring computers into the newsroom. So what did we do? And what did I do, slightly to my embarrassment? Went out on strike. <laughs> because we were not going to have computers. Uh, the reason, the reason there, there was one good reason for it, which was that uh, our much better funded colleagues over at ITN had also just got computers and they'd all got a thousand quid each for the indignity of having to accept a computer and we settled for 300 quid. Uh, <laughs> I thought uh, the taxpayer was very happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was my embarrassment. I, I then, you know, in, uh, I then got, uh, took to computers very quickly. Um, uh, I remember our, our first family computer. We, we lived next door to a, uh, a medical illustrator and I'd been left some money and I decided to, I'd been left 2,000 pounds and I decided to spend it all on a computer. Uh, and she said, you've got to have a, a Macintosh. I knew nothing about, uh, about this. This is the only kind of computer to have. And I said, but they're much more expensive. And she said, no, 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 you've got to have them. So we took her advice and bought an Apple Performer 630 uh, with a 250 megabyte hard disk. And I bought a printer and a modem and that all ended, added up to 2000 pounds. Yeah. And then I, this is 94, something like that. I uh, linked the modem. I worked out how to get the modem up and running, made those characteristic whistly noises. And we were online and my wife, and I and our five-year-old son sat in wonder uh, one day as a picture from the Louvre 
which had one of the early websites animated on line by line, very, very slowly. Uh, and we were all bewitched and from then on, you know, computers became an ever more important part of my life and I, became, I was also by then reporting, although I was a business correspondent, I was taking more and more interest in uh, what was happening in terms of uh, the web uh, and its impact on business and on society. So those, those early days, there was not a technology correspondent at the BBC? Well, there had been technology correspondents, but they had been in charge of covering things like space missions and aero engines and nuclear power stations. Okay. There was a whole new... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was not actually appointed technology correspondent uh, until 2007, although in 2000, when I was showing a great interest in all this because covering the rise of Google and the dot-com bubble was much more interesting than Marks and Spencer's annual results again. Um, uh, they said briefly to me in March 2000, we're going to make you internet correspondent. I said, oh, that's a good idea. Uh, and my wife, who is a very smart economist, said to me, that's a sell signal if ever I heard one. Uh, and she was right because the day they appointed me was the day the Nasdaq collapsed. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and three months later, the bosses turned to me and said, oh, the internet seems to be over. Go back to being business correspondent. <laughs> um, I carried on, although I was still, my title was business correspondent, I kept on doing more and more technology stories. And eventually in 2007, they said, oh, internet seems to be back. We're going to call you technology correspondent. Which is Let me talk a little bit about the, the skill base that you'll have built up as a, as a business correspondent, because your first book, Dot Bomb, is interesting in that it, it looks very much at how businesses developed. You clearly had a very strong understanding of the viability of businesses. You seem to almost have watched it in awe. How important were those skills that you'd had prior to being appointed the technology correspondent uh, in order to tell the story properly about what was happening? Well, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. You, you say, you know, the business knowledge was useful, but of course the business knowledge was, went out the window, the received wisdom that, you know, to, to be a, a viable business, you had to actually have some revenue or, or even better profits. That went way out the window briefly in 2000 and, and then again more recently. Uh, but it did, I mean, it, what it did give me was uh, a respect for numbers and uh, I think a healthy cynicism uh, along with, I mean, I was very bewitched by the technology I saw unfolding, but I was also properly sceptical, which I am still today, about some of the, the businesses being built on top of that technology and how viable they were. I mean, just to, I was, happened to be on a tube or something the other day, and I was looking at my Apple Stocks app, and I was looking at the, the share price of Tesla, um, which is, is valued at a um, trillion dollars. Right, uh, and I was comparing it to, uh, well, I mean, famously, the, the value of Tesla. It, it, Tesla is now valued as much as all of the other car companies put together, <laughs> without having anything. Like, so it, it's built on its share price is built on the assumption that it is going to destroy the rest of the car industry, and they're all going to go bust. Uh, I was looking at its share price, and it's got something called a P.E. ratio, a price earnings ratio of over 200, uh, which is fanciful. By comparison, Ford and GM, which are both each worth about a 20th of them as much as Tesla, have got P.E. ratios of four, five, six. So that, that kind of knowledge gave me a bit of a... Uh, a bit of an angle on technology. I mean, one needed to cover that sector to have, frankly, a bit more technical expertise than I had. I'll, uh, I've done my best to get it. But also uh, a bit of business now too, uh, to make you ask, yeah, but how is it going to make any money? It, it, it's interesting because <coughs> we heard earlier said that the BBC called you the, the, the non-geek geek. geek. 
I don't know who wrote that, but um, I don't know. But as, yeah, yeah, yeah. as was said, probably somebody in the media relations department yeah, spent quite yeah, some yeah, time to think yeah. about it. The museum, uh, in granting you this honorary fellowship, were were very impressed with your ability to communicate to people for whom the technology wasn't something that they they looked at every day. You were interpreting challenging challenging things and trying to deliver them in a in a concise way. Did, did that come naturally to you? Well, it came from, I mean, in some ways, it's the very essence, both of being what you might call a popular journalist, a mainstream journalist, and a BBC journalist. The mission is both to um, inform and entertain, and do, to do it in a comprehensible ma manner. I've got to tell you a story here uh, about that. One of the most, with the biggest challenges I've faced in recent years is trying to explain quantum computing, which I don't bloody understand at all. Um, uh, I mean, which of us can say we've got an intimate knowledge of quantum? So two things. Uh, Microsoft took me off, uh, managed to sell me on the idea of explaining quantum computing to a mass audience on the 10 o'clock news. Uh, they took me off to Copenhagen, or I went off to Copenhagen, they flew people in from their labs in Seattle. They had a big lab in Copenhagen doing quantum. They, they made quite big claims which have since not quite stacked up. But anyway, we, we explained quantum computing. We did a graphic in the studio explaining the difference between a bit, naught or one, uh, and a qubit, which I said was zero and one, both at the same time. It may have not have been correct exactly. But, uh, and we did the whole thing. We were very, two and a half minutes on quantum computing on a mass evening bulletin. Uh, and at the end of the week, uh, this item got shown on Gogglebox. <laughs> and I hope you're not of a nervous disposition, but uh, I sat there watching it and I knew that I'd been working this unusually good PR man from Microsoft who I trusted. He, he, 10 years earlier, he'd sold me on the idea of doing something about cloud computing, which had was then a concept not known to the mass public, and we put that on the 10 o'clock news. And then we were doing this this time, and he'd, he'd invested a lot of you know, his effort and credibility within the corporation on getting this on. And we were both going, I think, in our respective homes, like, oh, God, like this. Uh, and they watched it, and there's this very smart uh, young Asian guys in, in the Google Box audience who had, had spotted me before and said, oh, it's old Rory again. Um, <laughs> And then they sat there and they turned to each other and they said, pardon my French, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and I rang up my um, man from Microsoft and I could hear him putting his head in his hands. <laughs> How am I going to explain Gogglebox to Redmond, you know? <laughs> uh, but or the another, Siddiquis. <laughs> or the, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and uh, another thing about quantum, I have continued to try uh, and write about it from time to time and also keep an eye on what we've had going on on the website about it, uh, on our, our technology section of the website. Uh, and a very useful guy has been an, a nice man called Professor Alan Woodward, who's a professor of cybersecurity uh, and generally a very good uh, and accessible explainer of this stuff. And he, he rang up once to have a chat because he said, one of the ways we'd explain quantum in a website story was just not quite right. And we talked it through and we talked it through and we couldn't really quite get there. And he, in the end, he said, Rory, I'm going to name what I'm going to call the Kathleen Jones paradox, which is that you can explain quantum computing comprehensibly or accurately, but never both at the same time. <laughs> Uh, and when I left the BBC, my lovely producer, Jat, gave me a mug with this paradox printed on it, which is one of my finest possessions. That's excellent. <laughs> but talking of explaining things in, a, in an easy way, this, the book of yours, the um, Always On Hope and Fear in the Smartphone Era. Available at all good bookstores, but mainly this one here. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tells, tells the story from, uh, from your perspective, from, from the dawn of the smartphone with the, the man in the brown turtleneck. The black turtleneck. Uh, black turtleneck. Yeah. Um, which, which, you know, there, there are various people who have attacked me over 
that, that being the dawn of the smartphone. People will say, there were smartphones, which is true. Long before the iPhone, there were smartphones. There was the Nokia communicator. There was something back in the 1990s, I think from Motorola, that was a smartphone. But I, I date it to the iPhone because that was the one which made everybody think differently about what mobile phones were for, that they were communication, uh, internet devices more than and, and, talking and devices. It was that that changed, that was a catalyst for change in society in the way that people communicate and the way that people interact with For with good computers. and ill. And it, in, I mean, the, the book really puts the point that in three or four years, a lot of things came together. So 2004, Facebook was founded. 2005, YouTube started. 2006, Twitter started. 2007, the iPhone came along. Together, you had these incredibly powerful mobile computers that, that made the internet go mobile, and these extraordinarily powerful, and later we learned, very dangerous social networks. And it was the combination of the two that was so, uh, had such an impact on the way we live. There's two aspects of that I'd like to touch on. The, the first is this is obviously a golden time in technology, or I assume a golden time in technology journalism. There's so much going on. There was. But, but you must have been pitched at by such a raft of people. Was that, was that challenging to actually spot where the good stir oh, stories were? Oh, that has definitely been the huge challenge over the years. I mean, uh, my inbox just got more and more groaning with pointless, I mean, the, the, the pointless press releases. I mean, the other, the other thing that's happened over the years is the ratio of journalists to PR people has gone in the wrong direction. Um, and there's ever more uh, guff coming at you. Uh, and what, what, I had, what I learned over the years was, you know, I, I mass deleted a lot of stuff, but you had to be careful because one of the best stories I ever had came to me in an email with the first line, Dear Roy. Um, <laughs> and it turned out to be from an engineer inside a company called Spinvox, which was claiming, which was an early AI company in a way. It was taking people's voicemails and turning them into text automatically um, using its brilliant technology, except that this guy revealed to me that the brilliant technology was hundreds of call centre workers in Egypt and the Philippines who'd not been paid, so might not be that careful with your secrets. <laughs> and I could have deleted that email like that. It brings me neatly on to the second part of that, which is trying to spot the truth mm. in, in the stories. And I, I assume that a journalist with your experience gets sort of a feel for a story that might feel not quite right. Did you have any? I, I shan't ask you for an example of one that oh, wasn't I'll give quite you right. An, I can give you. Please an, give us you? an example of one well, that wasn't I mean, quite right. Well, Spinvox was a good example. I, I mean, what, what you had, I mean, there, there are things that are not right, and there, there are things where you, you, which are potentially great technology with great people behind them, but they just don't quite work. There was a, and I was always keen to find, you know, great British startups. There was a lovely one called Chirp. Uh, developed by this brilliant sort of engineer, I think he was at UCL, and it was a whole system for exchanging data and information using sound. And so you'd associate, uh, say, a, a picture that yeah, I, I wanted to send to your <coughs> phone with a sound, a chirp, okay. uh, and I would play that chirp, and your phone, which also had the app, would listen to it, and the picture would transfer, and it was like all the best of technology, it was rather magical to listen to this and watch the photo go from there to there. And they thought there'd be all sorts of applications at, you know, gigs, that uh, the band would play a chirp and a piece of merchandise, virtual merchandise, would arrive on people's phones. But, of course, it, it would have driven everybody bonkers. So <laughs> it, it never happened. So that's an example of something that I was very excited about and never worked, but not not for bad reasons, uh, it was over-ambitious. Google Glass, another thing which I was incredibly excited about, and wore for three months on end, uh, until I began to realise that what my wife, my colleagues, uh, and everybody else said was right, which was, I looked an idiot. Um, <laughs> and that, that is a problem with technology that, that you want to make into the mass market. But then there were 
on the sort of dark side of that, there were companies that made ridiculous claims that were just not backed up. There was a company called Power, P-O-W-A. And this again speaks to my previous business knowledge, run by, um, I was going to say a complete chancer, allegedly, called Dan Wagner, uh, who was, he had sort of e-shopping technology uh, that he was touting furiously. Um, and he claimed he'd done some big deal in China, which we put on the website, and he'd beaten Apple Pay into China. Um, and it all turned out to be nonsense. Um, and one of the reasons I was sceptical was that I, he'd been around in the first dot-com bubble, uh, had been the chief executive of a company called Dialogue, which was rechristened by the stock market Dala Dog because it was such rubbish. And so I'd seen him coming, and when he went spectacularly bust, I was not that surprised. But despite all of this, <laughs> you, you personally embrace technology. Your, yeah. your smartphone is important to you, and you... Absol you almost you've... too important to me, according to my wife, you know. Um, well, how, imp how important has it been? Take, reflect on that question from your wife. How, how important has it been? Um, well, in particular, uh, social media has become a bit of an obsession. Twitter in particular. Uh, I was just checking my Twitter feed. Interesting policy, political news coming out. <laughs> Guess who's been fined for attending parties? Um, <laughs> breaking. Um, so. The title of the book's always on, and it kind of sums up my permanent connectivity, which has its good and bad sides. So I am, you know, obsessively checking my Twitter feed, um, obsessively checking, you know, the Brentford score when they're playing. Um, it, it, it does become the thing that you can't leave home without. I, I can leave home without my wallet. Um, it tells me if I've left home without my keys. Um, yeah, I mean, rather, yeah, it's, it's, rather it's embarrassingly, more important than, than just about anything. Rather embarrassingly, today when I, uh, I was halfway up the M1, I realised I'd left home without all of my credit cards. Yeah. But I can pay but with my phone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was uh, uh, yeah. surprising. But you're no longer at the BBC. Mm -hmm. You were a BBC lifer. Your, yeah. your journalism now is much more uh, personal. Your, yeah. your blogging and so on is more personal. So the need for you to be always connected, arguably, is not quite so much there when it's not your day job. Do you still have the same level of interaction, or is it... Uh, I'm afraid oh, is it I do. I sometimes worry about that. I, I, I do, and I kind of instinctively think, oh, there's a breaking story. Uh, oh, have I got a channel for it? I have got this newsletter, which I write, which is about health and technology. Um, so I need to keep up with that, is my view, but I don't necessarily need to... I don't need to watch the latest Apple event, although they've got more boring over the years. If I hear once more, this is the best iPhone we've ever made, I might scream, because I'm waiting for Tim Cook to say, this is probably the second best iPhone we've ever made. <laughs> Maybe that will be part of the uh, Kathleen Jones paradox. Yeah, when yeah. He does that. yeah. So, you mentioned about the rise of social media, um, and part of me thinks that if I just reflect on journalism for a moment, there being a professional journalist delivering ground truth to everybody from uh, well-known and established broadcasters, but now almost you feel like everyone... I, I've heard the expression, well, everyone's a journalist now, with social media being a platform for yeah. people. Uh, is that a hurtful comment? It's not a hurtful comment. I mean, uh, I remember I'd had a great trip to Korea before I was officially technology correspondent. I was sent to Korea in 2004, 2005, and we did some, I think, quite groundbreaking pieces. We did one piece on a social network there, before people knew about social networks, called Sci World, where we, we said to everybody, 75% of young people in Korea are on this social network, which was very much a kind of... Uh, I don't know, it was, had that kind of Korean flavour. They, they built themselves idealised rooms in their social media world. But the other piece we did was about um, 
citizen journalism. There was a, a big trend called citizen journalism, which basically spoke to that idea that anyone can be a journalist. And I think that idea kind of, it didn't die, but people began to wake up to what it meant because citizen journalism meant, in some cases, people who didn't get paid, yeah. which as a journalist, I thought was a bad idea. Um, but also, I mean, what we've learned over the last five years, if we've learned anything, is that not all journalism is equal, uh, that not all information is equal, that, that truth matters, professionalism matters, uh, and teaching people, and this is another thing I'm quite passionate about, teaching kids media literacy is really important. Uh, I do, t when I do these Speakers for Schools talks, I quite often do one about uh, misinformation. And I make the point that 20 year years ago, um, remember the newspaper, The Sunday Sport? If you saw that on a newsstand and it had that head, uh, the headline, World War II bomber found on moon, you knew what that was about. You knew the context and it would sit next to the, the boring old times or the telegraph with their more sober headlines and you'd recognize the difference in a in facebook blue or instagram frame world war ii bomber sits uh, uh, found on moon or, or government faces budget deficit um uh have equal credibility visually yes. uh and teaching people that is kind of a, a vital civics task media studies used to be derided as a stupid subject to do at school, and actually I think it's a, a very important subject now. I've, I've heard the term, I don't know if you have, data journalism. Yeah. Um, and yeah. What, does, what does that mean to you? I've, I've well, I've always had a slight issue with it. It's an incredibly valuable area, but it's, it's something that all journalists should, should, it's like saying an internet journalist. I mean, all journalists should use the internet now. Uh, all journalists should have some uh, understanding of data. Uh, I mean, BBC, we had sort of professional data people who would, um, you know, be, be very good at analysing numbers and where they came from and how, how they came together. I mean, we've seen, for instance, during the pandemic, I'm trying to remember the, the guy's name, I think it's John Byrne Murdoch on the FT, who produces these brilliant visualisations of what's happening. Um, <coughs> Uh, to case rates and so on uh, and comparatives and uh, you know understands that having a dodgy axis can be incredibly misleading so it is important but it is also a skill which all journalists sh should have in some form or another you know it, it's, it's things as simple as when you get a survey which is more and more drives me up the wall it used to oh, our latest survey shows I got one the other day saying 50% of young people have invested in crypto. And I said, where does this survey come from? You know, it's 200 people you've stopped on the street or, or more likely emailed or got to interact with some website. This is, this is not solid data. Let's, let's talk a little bit. We, we could easily go into the difficult area of, of how bad things can be on the internet, but there's also some extraordinarily good things that have come out. Mm. And uh, I... Obviously, in your, in your personal case, there was um, your, uh, your piece to camera where somebody was watching your broadcast and highlighted something about uh, your, your hand. Well, was that the internet? That's an interesting question. So the book starts by telling the story of, um, I think it's the 29th of May, 2019, which is the day that the first 5G network went live in the UK. So a big day in UK tech history, because for once we were kind of up there. We weren't lagging way behind. Uh, and I did a live broadcast over 5G, rather amusingly, from Covent Garden, sort of marking this into breakfast news. And it was all a bit kind of hairy, because uh, we were using a piece of Huawei kit, interestingly, uh, a, effectively a Huawei modem, 5G modem, to go live. And we came up to the studio in Manchester and I just checked in, we're, we're ready to go. And then suddenly the line went dead and I sort of cursed and said, what's gone wrong? Someone's pulled a cable out. And it turned out, uh, and the, we had PR people from EE with us because they were supplying the equipment. 
and there was great embarrassment because what they realised was they'd been testing the equipment for the two days before and they'd run out of data. <laughs> so somebody had to spend money on a top-up. Uh, anyway, I then did this live broadcast uh, explaining the merits of 5G and I was holding a phone like this uh, and then set off to do some more filming in Birmingham and the producer I met said, said to stop me and said, have you thought about... I'd been diagnosed three or four months earlier and she knew about this with Parkinson's. Um, and she said, have you thought about going public with it, about it? And I said, why? And she said, well, your tremor was quite visible. Earlier on, actually, somebody had written in on another occasion to say, oh, you should get that checked out. But I looked at it later and it was, I was tremoring like nobody's business, which I do under stressful situations like being interviewed by you, you see. <laughs> um, uh, and I thought about this and I thought, how do I do this? I will put out a tweet. And I put out a tweet from the train to Birmingham. By the time I got off the train, uh, Twitter had gone mad and I was sort of being phoned by national newspapers and bombarded with questions and the BBC press office got onto me and said, did, did I want to put out a statement and stuff like that. And it was, almost, it was the positive side of social media because nearly all the reactions were incredibly affirmative. There was one bloke who said, you've been standing too close to 5G masts. <laughs> um, but um, there's always a nutter. Uh, but mostly it was the positive reinforcing side of social media. And that's interesting because in your position as technology correspondent with all of your connections, I'm sure that there must have been people getting in touch with you saying, well, these are areas that we might be able to help, you might be able to help us by looking at the growth, the, the obvious growth in AI, diagnostics and so on. And that's yeah. something that you moved on now, having left the BBC into uh, taking an active interest in is the, the medical use of... Yeah, no, I'm, I, uh, funnily enough, even before I'd been diagnosed, I'd gone to do a piece about a medical company in London, medical tech company, which was collaborating with a Chinese giant Tencent to try and use uh, an AI system to diagnose Parkinson's. And they, uh, they had some guy standing in front of a camera doing this, which is one of the things that you do. That they, uh, and I thought, God, I find that quite difficult. Um, it was one of the sort of first signals to me that I probably had a problem. Uh, but, but since then, I've got you know, very interested, obviously, in, in that whole area. I did a, uh, I've got this newsletter, as I say, about health tech. I did a really interesting story the, uh, a few months back about a house in Bristol which has been fitted out with all sorts of sensors and they go and they put people with Parkinson's in it uh, for five days uh, and try and measure their symptoms because one of the, the, the huge mystery about Parkinson's and one of the difficulties is, is measuring it. Uh, they've basically got a very crude one to four measurement generally and this had caused huge problems. There's a massive drugs trial that everyone was very excited about three or four years ago called GDNF, I think it was, where they basically drilled a hole in people's skulls and piped this drug direct into their, into their brains. Uh, and the drug worked, uh, people felt better, but the people on the placebo got better too. And the gap between the two was not big enough for this drug to be given the go-ahead. Okay. And the guy behind the drug, the, the, the doctor running the trial, said the huge problem is we need to get better technology to measure more accurately people's symptoms. And they're developing this technology that they will then put into the homes of people on a drugs trial to give a better gradation of what the impact of, the of uh, any drug has been. Before I take some questions from the, from the audience in a few minutes, I'd just like to finish this, this part by talking about your, your views on education, the curriculum, and, yeah, and how yeah. we're doing in schools. Yeah. I know that's close to your heart. Yeah. Well, tell, me, tell me a little more about, about your feelings about that. Well, I got, I got, it's about 2012, 2011, 2012. I mean, lots of things came together. So, and I tell the story in the book, in, in May 2011, 
uh, David Braben and Eben Upton from Cambridge came to me with this prototype of this little device that they said that was going to be called the Raspberry Pi. And could I get the BBC to take it up and make it the new BBC Micro? And I said, don't be daft. Uh, I've got, A, I've got no influence in BBC, and B, the BBC won't do anything like that. But I can maybe do a little video of it. And I did a little video of it on my iPhone, put it on YouTube, and it went viral. Um, and they said to me afterwards, that was the moment they realised that, oh, maybe we'd really better do this. Um, and the Raspberry Pi st started with that mission uh, the following February. But the mission got slightly knocked off course by the sheer popularity of the device amongst hobbyists. Because, you know, it was m meant for kids. It was meant to get a new generation interested in coding. But it did do that eventually. So that was there. And Eric Schmidt from Google came over and made a speech. Uh, and somebody, I forget, I met somebody who, who told me that they'd put this line in his speech. Somebody, I think, from uh, a civil servant, uh, saying he was uh, astounded that in the land of you know, computing, where computing had basically started, it was still not a, coding was still not a subject in schools. Uh, and then there was a report by a guy called Ian Livingston from the games industry called Next Gen Skills, which again called for complete reform of the curriculum. And so what happened then was the curriculum was reformed and this subject called ICT, which everybody was very contemptuous of, because they said it basically taught you to do Microsoft Word and Excel, was got rid of and replaced by something far more rigorous, uh, computing stroke computing science, GCSE and A-level. And in a way that's been good, um, but I've been tracking the numbers about what's happened. Because there was a small minority of ICT teachers who cried foul at the time and said, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There, there, is, there is value in this ICT subject if you maybe reform it a little. Because the problem was that the smart kids went for computing science, but the schools were not very encouraging. Schools do, do, don't like subjects that are, that are really hard because it affects their Ofsted scores, yep. uh, they didn't have the teachers to teach it, um, so they weren't particularly encouraging. Uh, and what you hap happened after a few years was, was that you had ICT, which was a subject done 40% by girls, 60% by boys, and by quite a lot of people, disappeared, and had a much smaller cohort doing computer science or computing, and that was just 20% girls. So the end result was that you had, yes, great smart kids turning up at university, which is what you wanted, but you then had the majority of kids leaving school without any digital qualification. And you can argue about, you know, uh, the value of coding as a skill. I, I think it's a great thing to have because it's a way of thinking. It's not that they're all going to become coders. Um, but it, it's, it seems to me that we've, uh, we've only got halfway there. And this is a common thing in British education, I think. Um, there are people here who know more about the education system than I do. But I think a, a common theme is that we kind of super serve the high end. Uh, and as a, a nation, I, 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 you know, talking to people in, the, in industry, they are very worried about the lack of digital skills by them amongst the mass of the population. Well, I know that it's, it's customary that our honorary fellows at some point will deliver a lecture uh, here at the museum. Uh, perhaps that might be the subject that you would return that to. That might be, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, let me take the opportunity. We've got a wonderful audience here, um, and I think some of them have indicated that they might want to ask a question. We have a roving mic that we'll bring round if anybody has a question they'd like to ask of Rory while, he, while he's here. Anybody got a question? Don't be shy. In interesting hearing you talking about the Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. which we might think of as the second iteration of the BBC B and micros in schools. Mm. Do you actually have any, I mean, I know you were um, business rather than technology um, at that time, but do you actually have any memories of, you know, should we say iteration one, the BBCB and micros in schools. I was too old. Um, 
because that came along in the 80s when uh, I was already working for the BBC. So I kind of knew about it, but I missed out. And uh, I think that was, I, I would say the Raspberry Pi is slightly more important. Is it? Well, I mean, you, 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 one of the things that almost knocked the Raspberry Pi off course was there was such enthusiasm and excitement from people. Actually, people like Eben Upton, one of the founders of it, who himself had uh, had a BBC Micro, uh, that, you know, that in, at first that was quite intimidating, I think, to a number of kids uh, getting into it. And then that was sort of dealt with. One of the great triumphs, by the way, of Raspberry Pi was the community they built around it, which was Eben Upton's wife, Liz, masterminded that. And she was very firm right from the start because there was a, 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 at the beginning, there was a, quite a nasty element in the forums whereby they were very dismissive of people who didn't understand everything. And she stamped on that very quickly and kicked, kicked people out. Uh, and it was, you know, one of the few areas which wasn't riven with trolls and abuse. So I think that was important. Um, yeah, it, 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 it did, did sort of build, build on the BBC Micro, but what they came to understand, the people behind them, the Raspberry Pi, was that it was a different age. The BBC, for instance, was not going to back it. It, it had to be a much more kind of guerrilla uh, operation. And it was, of course, fueled by social media. I mean, it's one of the things that was a success because of social media. It was immediately, you know, a trending topic all across Twitter and vast numbers of Facebook groups and so on. Question down here at the front. Was there ever a technology story that you missed and you wished you had got? Oh, um, golly. Uh, I think more that technology stories I got wrong. I remember saying on the day that Google floated and everyone quoted it back to me uh, at our morning meeting, that company Google is vastly overvalued, you know. <laughs> uh, I, and I also... Uh, when Mark, Mark Zuckerberg came to London in 2008 and I did an interview with him and he was 24 and he's never been very charismatic but at that stage he was still looking at his own shoes rather than yours um, uh, and he had just turned down somewhere between one and ten billion dollars for his company and I gave him a firm lecture as this old wise old git um, <laughs> saying well why didn't you sell up you know that, that's going to look pretty foolish isn't it and he, he sort of very, rather quietly said, no, no, I don't know what I'd do if I sold up, you know, what would I do? Uh, and of course he was right, yeah. And I was too sceptical about the potential of that business. Um, but, I mean, the biggest story, uh, I'm going to talk about one I did get right, because that's the way politicians do that. That's a very interesting question, but more interesting <laughs> is the fact that... Uh, how, how sceptical a lot of people were about the iPhone. So uh, the, the major sort of opening chapter is about the day uh, I went to the launch. I was there when Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone. Uh, and how there were complaints to the BBC about my piece because people wrote in to say, that was just a product plug. Why was that on the 10 o'clock news? And I was hauled on to this program called Newswatch to defend myself. Uh, and I kind of screwed up my courage and made what I thought even at the time was a fanciful parallel. I said, well, w should the BBC, if it had been around, have covered the launch of the Model T Ford by Henry Ford? That turned out to be a key moment in, in history, you know, the, the launch of the popular automotive age. And maybe this will be a key moment too. So... It's not just a product, it may say something more about us. Uh, and for once, <laughs> I was right. Uh, and within four years, the entire, well, the entire mobile phone industry had been, don't forget, Nokia had 40% of the market and a lot more of the profits. Uh, Blackberry was a major force. Uh, your HTCs of this world and Motorola's were major forces. 
and most of them had been wiped out within four years. So maybe a supplementary while someone else thinks of a question. You're travelling back home by train, I think. Mm -hmm. If you had to share the compartment with, I don't know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, pick your oh. technology person of choice, which one would you want it to be and what would you ask them? Oh, I think it would be Steve Jobs uh, because I, 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 Bill Gates is quite dull company, I think. Um, he's got more interesting over the years. Um, I've interviewed um, Elon Musk, who, is, uh, who gave great interview, but he's completely insane. Um, <laughs> I'd be, be frightened that he'd take over the train and send it in a different direction, <laughs> buy it and say, we don't want this kind of train. Um, uh, Steve Jobs, I, I got to interview twice, but under the most controlled circumstances where you each came in and sat down and got two questions. And I'd, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask him what he, what, what he thinks has happened to innovation at Apple and whether he, he thinks it's still on track. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm trying to picture life inside the Sullen Jones house, household. Um, how do you limit your use of social media? Um, are you allowed to take a smartphone to the dining table? My wife is quite firm about this. Um, no phones at the table, but she's been known to do it too, so every now and then I, I rebel. Um, years ago, um, I did a piece for the radio about and I illustrated the importance of the internet in people's lives. Uh, and our, our oldest, who's now a father uh, and 31, w ha was in the loft where he, he, his base was. He was about 14, um, playing, you know, Grand Theft Kills, 4290 Assassin Death. Um, and I, I switched off the router and held a microphone up. And then, literally 10 seconds later, Dad, what's up with the internet? You know, and I kind of made the point of how. Uh, 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 and that, obviously, that's become uh, much more vital in all our lives. We're, we're all, you know, shocked and horrified. Um, it happened again this week, because Virgin came and did some work. And there are three of us in, in the household now all actually working from home. Uh, my wife's away three days a week, but is, you know, doing important things, unlike me. Um, and another child has got a job with a data company working from the back, back office. So, you know, that kind of connectivity is very important. And we're all far too much on our phones, I'm afraid. We're always on. <laughs> There's one there. Rory, we first met in 2001, and I, I was PRing a story on the eLearning Foundation to put laptops in the hands of every child in the country, because this was at the height of the dot-com bubble. We didn't know what was coming next, of course, although we might have guessed. Um, and you had that story. It was going to run on the 9 o'clock news. And then foot and mouth came along. Oh, yes. And I was sent out on a foot and mouth story instead. And the foot and mouth story occupied the news 25 minutes of the 30-minute bulletin for yeah. about the next several months. Yeah. So the story, you, ev you were eventually able to put out the story uh, through breakfast TV or something. Mm. But are there any stories? It suddenly made me realise how difficult your job was in terms of getting stories to air. You really have to compete with all sorts of other stories. And it got worse over the years, yeah. Is there any story that you look back on and think, oh, we should have been able to get that story to air? Um, I mean, generally, all the time, getting things to air was, a, was very difficult because technolo technology was one of those things which editors said they loved, but it was always nice to have rather than must have. And especially in the era of you know, Trump and Brexit and whatever, they just got squeezed out. I, I do remember, I was sent very early on, when they made me internet correspondent, they sent me to the West Coast to do some stories. And on the way, I stopped off in this town in Georgia, 
where they'd given everybody the internet through their television. It was a poor town and they'd wired up the whole town to get the internet through their TVs. And we filmed this piece, thought this is a good story. Uh, got back, uh, it was in early May, um, and uh, sat and watched the, the nine o'clock news, I think it was. And my piece is going out, my piece is going out. And then there was, oh, we're just going over live, there's been a riot at a football match. <laughs> piece fell off the air. And it sat there and it eventually went out in September where while everybody pointed out there was blossom on the trees <laughs> in, the, in the pictures. So it was a constant battle. I mean, I, I think the, the bigger danger was not that I, uh, I necessarily missed anything huge, but that you began to kind of not fight hard enough to do those trends. What, what, what was difficult for me increasingly was trying to do those important trends that were not actually hard news on the day. So it's one of the reasons I used to, I used to hate going to this gadget fair called CES in Las Vegas, uh, which was a nightmare to do. The time difference was awful. And uh, I grew, after the first two occasions on my 11th visit, to really not like Las Vegas at all. But I wanted to go because it was a peg on which to hang things. But each year, they'd get more resistance about sending me. And they'd say, well, what's the big trend this year? And you'd say, well, it's going to be all about AI this year. And they said, no, you said that last year. <laughs> AI was last year. What's new this year? So it was always this kind of uncomprehending idea that things move on in that unsubtle way. And it was, I mean, in, in a way, the first stage, we were talking about translating complex subjects uh, for a wide audience. But the first difficult audience was you know, your BBC editor uh, who had to listen to the political editor talking about their story and the health editor talking about their story. Now, what's this about Elon who? You know, so that, that was always the big challenge. I think we're done. I think we are. Let me, it's customary to close with two trivial questions. <laughs> <laughs> I've only um, thought of peanut one. Peanut butter. Excellent. <laughs> well, and talking of, talking of smartphones, um, do you ever see yourself not with an Apple product in your hand? Well, I, I always had and still have uh, an Android phone as well as an iPhone. Uh, but it, it, w it became very difficult because I think it's, it's very difficult to run two phones. Um, <coughs> you never, I, I, lost, I lost one because, you know, <coughs> it wasn't ringing and I didn't notice it. Um, so they are ridiculous when you think about it, because what is amazing about the modern smartphone is that they're all brilliant. And a 150 quid Android is not that different from, a, you know, frankly, a thousand pound iPhone. It's got a slightly worse camera. And I, I'm kind of used to the iOS interface rather than the Android interface. But if I was sensible, I'd be getting the 150 quid Android. Um, I did go and spend money on this a few months ago, and you know it's fine. But do you, do you think you'll ever pick up an actual camera and take photographs again? I've got. I was clearing out my very mucky cubby hole the other day, and I've got two SLR cameras. I mean, here's a story about how the world's changed. At that first unveiling the iPhone, I was there with a great cameraman called Steve Adrain, but I also had my digital SLR camera and I took a few snaps uh, of Steve Jobs on the stage unveiling the iPhone. They came out terribly because I was not very good with it and the lighting conditions were poor and it was quite difficult. Seven years later, I went to the launch of the Apple Watch and took some rather good photos of Tim Cook unveiling that. And of course, I took them on an iPhone. Um, so for uh, an unprofessional cameraman, this has been better than a, an SLR camera. Yeah. Well, it, it has been a, a wonderful day, and I have to say, an absolute privilege to welcome you here to congratulate you on this award. And for me to have the chance to sit and talk to you is, uh, is a one off. And I'm really, really pleased to shake your hand and thank you very much indeed, Rory. Well, thank you. It's been great fun. Great fun.